Okay. Um, I am going to start with... Uh, this is really exciting that everyone's here tonight. This is great. I'm going to start with a just reading one of my sessions. They're called sessions instead of chapters because of the shrink uh, <laughs> connection. So I'm going to read a session and then I'm going to show you several of the images from the book and talk to you a little bit about the book and then I'm going to follow up with one more session and don't be scared because they're really short and they're fast. So I'm not going to, you know, take forever, but we will get the picture up in a second. Um, okay, so until we do that, I will, what will I do? I will, I will wait. Actually, as, um, as Judith said, I am a painter, and I haven't been doing much painting lately. I've been doing this. I've been creating this comic book for the last, I hate to say it, five years, and it's actually longer than that. It's sort of a, an incredibly long, drawn-out process. Um, and here it is, and it, it's sort of, it's almost like if this were a child, it would be in kindergarten, but it's not. Um, but I think we're getting, yeah, here we go. Okay. So my off-the-cuff stuff is coming to an end. All right. All right. So this is the cover of the book. It's called Graphic Therapy Notes from the Gap Years. And um, just for those of you who are disturbed by the Hitler image on the front cover, I'm Jewish. And I have major Nazi fears. So they're on there for a reason. It's not, you know, that I'm... Um, it's not that I like him or anything. Okay. So this one is called Session One, Dosed Up on NyQuil. Hi, my name is Emily and I'm a recovering artist. I'm told I'm creative, whatever that means. Well that and a buck fifty will maybe get you a ride on the subway. Sometimes I think I'm a dilettante. Sometimes I think I'm a fucking genius. It all depends on my dosage for the day. <laughs> I'm roughly 5'11", which is tall for a girl, and heavier than I should be right now, but shoulds are off limits, according to Vic, my therapist. I'm the youngest of four children and the only girl. The frosting on the cake, my mom always said. The downside of this setup was that I basically thought I was a boy until I was about 25 years old. <laughs> Once, when I was six, I told my dad I really, really wanted white ice skates with red pom-poms. He said, sure. I was amazed. Things didn't usually happen that quickly in my family. I followed him down to the basement of our 1963 split level to check out the new skates. I should have known something was up because we hadn't gone to a store to buy them. <laughs> Dad gave me a box and I opened it. I pulled out my old black skates, my brother's hand-me-downs. They had been spray painted white. The paint was already flaking. Tied to the skates were two big red pom-poms. Well, at least they got the pom-poms right. Did they think I wouldn't notice that these were just my old black skates painted? Thanks, I mumbled, feeling guilty that I was obviously less than ecstatic. So things have been a bit weird lately. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I mean, according to the normal plan, the nice Jewish girl plan, I was supposed to be married to a mensch, living in the birds, and schlepping my darling children all over creation in my oversized SUV, a cumbersome but stylish vehicle which resembles a living room more than a mode of transport. Vic, my therapist, says this is a fucking fantasy, and that there is no normal. Well, that's all well and good and centered and balanced and shit, but Christ. <laughs> I'm turning 39 years old this year, and things are definitely not going according to any plan at all. Instead, I'm living alone in a center city, Philadelphia, light-filled, architecturally charming, but thoroughly mouse-infested, Queen Anne-style, circa 1861 apartment. I have declared war on the nasty varmints, and have, poisoned, uh, and have positioned poison and glue traps all over the perimeter of the apartment. A few nights ago, I awoke startled to the disorienting sound of a high-pitched shriek. For several seconds, I couldn't identify the shockingly pitiful cry as I hovered between dream and reality, but then it became clear. It was yet another unfortunate critter screaming for redemption. 
My gay landlords live in the fabulous bi-level apartment upstairs and play throbbing disco music at all hours of the day and day. Oh, sorry. When I tell them about the ongoing mouse infestation, they laugh crazily, wring their hands, nod earnestly, and with faux sympathy, tell me to get a cat. The freak who lives in the apartment downstairs is a total stoner. He used to run drugs in Thailand. Now he just blasts classic rock and heavy metal into the wee hours of the morning. That's when he returns from his bartending gig at Carolina's, an upscale bar on 20th Street. Tragically, about a year ago, his beautiful young wife up and died, just <coughs> up and died, totally out of the blue. From then on, as you can imagine, the stoner bartender was pretty much wasted 24-7. When I can't take it anymore, I go down in the middle of the night to ask him to turn the noise off. I knock at the door, realize he can't hear anything over the violent racket, and wait till the break between Black Sabbath selections. Finally, after an excruciatingly long time, the door opens and a huge cloud of smoke wafts out, followed by the stoner himself, who appears totally confused and apologetic. Sorry, dude. Didn't realize it was so loud. As if this is the first time it's happened. Completing the scenario is the Swami, who lives in the flat on the other side of my bedroom wall. He leads a prayer group of some unnamed Eastern sect. Three times a day, like clockwork, he rings a high-pitched bell, then the droning, atonal notes of his religious chants seep through the wall into my airspace. Between the mice, my dancing queen landlords, the stoner, and the sect leader, I am surrounded. So, it's January. And the temperature is hovering at a sickly 60 degrees. Wait, this is the Northeast. Isn't it supposed to be cold this time of year? <coughs> oh, right, of course I forgot the polar ice caps are melting. Anyway, for the past five days I've had the flu and have been languishing in bed, dripping with sweat. The nasty virus has decided to lodge itself in my left ear, making it exceedingly painful to swallow, not to mention difficult to hear. Basically, all I could manage at this point was to change the sheets when they soaked through, watch copious bad TV, and for a change of pace, drag my giant butt into the bathroom. I felt like a medieval bubonic plague victim. As I lay in bed, snorting, sniffling, and otherwise musing drowsily, a foul odor began to permeate my room. At first, I thought it was my own sick, rotting, flu-infested body. But soon, it became obvious that the rank smell was that of a decomposing mouse lying dead somewhere in the vicinity. Now, this totally sucked, as by now, I had already dosed up with NyQuil and was comfortably channel surfing and ready to check out for the night. I heaved out of bed and quickly checked the perimeter. There were no creatures in sight, and yet the stench still lingered. I was beginning to think it was a foul cosmic joke of sorts. Then it struck me. Because of the menacing global warming induced spring-like weather, the mouse on the glue pad, which I had sent sailing out the window a couple of days before into the comforting frost, was paying me a dreaded and odiferous return visit. Happy New Year. So, thank you. Thank you. So, I'd like to just share with you a couple of um, images from the book. <laughs> which I'll, I'll go through quickly and sort of talk to you about the genesis of it and how it happened and, and so forth. Um, as Judith said, I'm a painter, but lately I've been, I haven't been painting much. I have been making comics. And uh, this is Victor, and you'll see him appear over and over again in the books, um, in the sessions. Here he is again. This is when I was telling him that I was a drama queen. And he's just like, I can't deal with you anymore. <laughs> and um, th this guy, Victor, is, well, the interesting thing is most of the, the drawings in the book I drew while I was up at a artist residency at the Vermont Studio Center in 2005. Um, I would paint from the model every morning, and in the afternoons, I would draw all the other artists there. And those are the people that sort of people the book. So all the people that you see were these artists from 2005 in at the Vermont Studios uh, Center Residency. Graphic Therapy is a memoir about my life as an artist, but it's also about the tribulations of dating, obsessions over weight, Nazi nightmares, potential infertility, 
the weird um, all over neurotic craziness of growing up Jewish and just the weirdness and absurdity of life as we know it. All tied together with the ongoing thread of sessions with Vic, my shrink. The stories began over a period of about six years in 1996. There was a time in my life when I was in a bit of a free fall, trying to find a foothold anywhere in any port in the storm. Fast forward, this is actually when I'm saying goodbye to Victor, but that actually hasn't happened. <laughs> Fast forward to 2005, um, I went to the Vermont Studio School, I told you that, I did the drawings, okay. Fast forward to 2007, I wondered what could I do with all these stories that I'd made. They were kind of lying around, and um, I needed an outlet for them. And luckily, a friend of mine connected me with Larry Smith of Smith Mag, an online memoir site, and he really, he was looking for a serial web comic. This is me in my studio, actually. And these are all images of um, the artist's studio. That's actually a painting that I did that's six foot by six foot that's in one of the stories. So it's really cool that some of the paintings that I made made their way into the book. Um, so anyway, we had I, the graphic novel ran bi-weekly uh, for about a year and a half on Smith Magazine. It was a great experience, and I came up with 20 stories. Now, because the tales in the book are from so long ago, I, I happily feel somewhat removed from the character of, Emil, of the Emily in the book, almost as though she were a distant and unfortunate cousin. <laughs> the distance makes it easier to tell the stories and somewhat lessens the chagrin of overexposure. And interestingly, um, this is actually paintings that were in my parents' dining room. Um, and again, the artist's palette and the studio and so forth. Um, so then we move on to the sort of obsession with Judaism, and here we are with the carrying the Torah around the synagogue, and the sort of amb ambiguous feelings I have about that. Um, <clears throat> here we are witnessing the angel telling Abraham not to kill Isaac on Rosh Hashanah. Um, my two grandmothers coming from Brooklyn bearing babkas <laughs> on the high holidays, which was always fun. Um, and here we are, I have a whole chapter about how being a Jew at Christmas is really difficult because it's just difficult. You should, you should read the book because it's, it's kind of funny. Okay. And here we are, you know, we, all we have is the menorah sitting around with the menorah and it's just, you know, it's what it is. Um, anyway, here I am in the Moses basket. <laughs> and so then we move on to the obsession with Nazis, which is... Uh, pretty frequent, although I have to say my dreams are getting less, um, I don't have them as much anymore, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, and I don't know how many of you guys went to Hebrew school, but they showed us really disturbing pictures at a very early age, and I think that was part of this obsession. Uh, anyway, so then we have uh, the KKK who come in and they're sort of terrorizing as well, and, you know, trying to hide in the suitcases. <laughs> And then we go on to the dating situation. And at first, <laughs> at first, I tried really hard to find a nice Jewish boy. Um, but then I said, you know what? They're only 3% of the population. <laughs> uh, these were some of my early tries. And this was someone who I called, uh, this was someone I called Tefillin Man. Because he did Tefillin. And this was my foray into Pakistan which didn't last very long. Um, and this was someone who was obsessed with the Wonder Bra at some point. Uh, and then this one, I just liked the um, phone with all the hearts coming out of it, so I wanted to show that to you. And this is the last one of that sequence of this guy that I met out in Colorado who was just sort of whatever. <laughs> but this one is really kind of funny. This one is Dr. Buttcrack who was the nice Jewish doctor, and it didn't end well. <laughs> this is me in the pool at Dr. Buttcrack's um, swim club. Okay, all babes around the pool. Okay, and finally, there, there was also an obsession with marriage in the book. Um, so here I am sort of looking at the, the rings and the dresses, and they believe it or not, they have this thing called the Bridal Armoire Company, which sells a a armoire case that you keep your wedding dress in. And that's what that's pictured there. That is that. So these are just some, you know, designs of wedding dresses, and here we are. Okay. And also, of course, Charles and Diane. 
So finally, I just want to read one thing, and then I'm going to read one last, um, one, one other chapter, and then I'll, I'll end. Um, people ask, why did I write a memoir? Aren't you just being self-indulgent? And the answer is, because this is what I know to write about. It's what comes out and what feels most emotionally true, even though it can be thought of as too much information. It's strange to be writing a memoir in this age of too much information. I feel as battered down as the next poor soul by the relentlessness of our overconnected culture. The ceaseless ringing of the cell phone, the sirens wailing in the background, the noxious Twitter of Twitter, and the replacement of serious news with blogs. So why should I be adding my own voice to the cacophony? Well, my hope is that people will read these stories, connect to the uncomfortable underbelly in some way, and maybe feel less alone. So I'm just going to read one more story, and it's called The Ascendancy of the Banal. Let's see if I can find it here. All right, here we go. <clears throat> well, the verdict is in. I'm fat. My very well-meaning but boundary-challenged friend wants to do an intervention on me. This is what she learned in grief, grief therapy. If someone you care about has a problem and is in denial about it, you intervene and bring the problem into the light of day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Heal me. Take me to the altar. Help me see the light. Give me the deal of meals. Excuse me. Like I don't know I have a problem? Like I don't obsess about it at least 50% of my waking and sleeping hours? I went to my first Weight Watchers meeting at age 14. Give me a fucking break. The problem is that life goes on while you're waiting for your hair to grow out of a bad haircut or while you're shedding 50 unwanted pounds. Clearly, I still had a long way to go towards self-actualization. I was frittering about, accomplishing little, behaving as if my life was a cheap, expendable bauble, and dating men who were like me, who heirs of the first order. For example, there was the Manhattan actor who specialized in playing doormen and policemen in the movies. I rented a couple of the flicks to check him out. In one, he played a doorman with such grace and temerity that I was moved to tears. <laughs> a mutual friend gave me his number. On our first phone date, we talked till all hours of the night. He had a deep, resonant voice that reeked of the stage. I can't wait to see you, he said, breathing heavily into the receiver. Why don't you take the train up here right now? He was actually drooling into the phone, and it was coming out the other end. I was dying to meet this guy. So after several of these chats, we decided I should go up to New York and we would meet. It was a fine March day on the cusp of spring. I am tracked up to New York City and then subway to Gramercy Park. At his apartment, I asked the doorman to buzz, to buzz me in. He's not here, hon. He's not home. You'd think if you were expecting someone from out of town who you were meeting for the first time, you might be at home, right? You'd think, I should have just split. But my little nightmare was just beginning. <laughs> Being the clueless young thing that I was, I went around the corner and waited for him in one of those amazing only in New York Greek restaurants. <laughs> this one was, shall I say, marvelous. Wallpaper murals of the Acropolis alternated with ones of Athena being birthed right out of the head of Zeus. <laughs> Plastic ferns hung from every crevice. My personal fave is the revolving dessert gizmo, where the perfect pies and cakes of Wayne Tebow frame twirl on an endless carousel. In New York, the oozing selections of gigantic pastries are always about 500 times bigger than normal baked goods. A muffin can easily be the size of a baseball glove. So I ordered off the 80-page laminated menu, menu and contemplated my situation. Ate my grilled cheese and tomato and rye, slurped some java, and went back to try again. This time, the doorman announced that my errant swain was in fact home. I rang the bell. He peered through the peephole and said, are we ready for this? You can still turn around. We don't have to actually meet. I was finally starting to clue in that this might be a freak show. <laughs> the door opened. Standing there was this enormously massive man, oh, sorry, stuffed like a sausage into a pair of mustard-covered coveralls, 
his pant legs inserted into his zippered black combat boots, huge black 1960s NASA mission control glasses, and a shock of very dyed black hair completed the look. But it turned out that I wasn't his type. That's what he informed me five seconds after opening the door. He did flaw a matic on me. He's like, you're just really not my type. And I'm thinking, yeah, and you're my Prince Charming. It's like, I'm supposed to be a beauty queen, but it's perfectly okay for him to be a warden-fested homunculus with halitosis. NASA man explained he was late because he'd been at an AA meeting and got caught in midtown traffic. I should have run screaming. But instead, I went in and sat. NASA man lowering himself with great difficulty, difficulty due to a bad back down onto the sofa. It was early March and he had the AC blasting full bore. We were making chit chat. The next part is more humiliating than an anal probe. <laughs> he started yawning and then I kid you not, he fell asleep. He just nodded off. It was the ultimate cosmic humiliation. It's like having the elephant man tell you he's not into you. It's like having a troll who has leprosy and several missing teeth tell you you just don't quite cut it. I swear, I'm going to move to Alaska, and this was pre-Sarah Palin, <laughs> and take up bear hunting. I will live off the land and become a grizzly motherfucker. I will host a talk show and proclaim to the world the ascendancy of the banal. I will send explosives through the mail and call myself the Unabomber. I will tap dance naked through the Tuileries, throwing rose petals to the waiting throng. Seriously, I've had enough of this fruitless chase. Tell Thomas on the mountain it's time for tea and his afternoon rest on the porch. It's time, almost, to leave the sanitarium.